message for us, and we've been talking in this series called Ever Wonder Why. We've been answering and asking some really big questions, and some of those questions have been um, like, why does God send bad people to hell, and, and why does God let bad things happen to good people, and we've been just hitting these questions absolutely head on, and, and it's been, I think, really eye-opening for me as I've studied the material, and, and I've heard some good feedback from you guys, so I feel like this has been really resonating with us as a church, and, and I think it's because these are the things that we think about all day, every day anyway. When stuff happens in our life, we think the question, does God love me? Does God really care about me? And so it's something that we, we have a duty to answer these questions. Because I want to arm you and equip you with the ability to come up with some answers when these questions pop up. And so today what we're talking about is kind of an interesting topic, but we're talking about trust. And so what what exactly does it mean to to trust? So trust is going to be a little bit different from faith. So here in church, we often talk about having faith in God. But then there's also this idea of having trust. So I can have faith in my wife, but I also very much trust my wife. I can have faith in my wife's love for me, and I can trust that... Actually, let me do this the other way around. My wife can have faith in me that I love and honor her, but she cannot trust me to send me to Woolworths to go to the grocery store. (laughs) See, there's a difference between faith and trust there. So what what exactly does it mean to trust? A a definition here for you is trust is a firm belief in the reliability, truth, or ability of someone or something. So a good example here would be seatbelts. You put a seatbelt on in your car, and you trust that if you get into an accident, that seatbelt is going to work to protect you. Another example here is is my son Benjamin, a three-year-old. We can tell him anything in the world, and he just trusts and believes that 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 is the truth. In fact, for the longest time, when Benjamin would walk around the house and say, Where's mom? Where's mom? Everyone with kids knows this stage. Dad's around, big brother's around, doesn't matter, I want mom, where's mom, where's mom? So I started telling Benjamin that, oh, mom's going dodos, which is Benjamin's term for going, going number two. Eve, Casey wasn't going dodos. She would be somewhere in the house doing something or trying to steal a couple minutes alone, and it was just easier to tell Benjamin that mom was using the potty, even when she was, because he would say, okay, well then she obviously needs privacy. When he goes dodos, he wraps himself in a curtain so that no one can see him, so he figures, well, maybe that's what mom needs as well. But there's a, a, a trust there that Benjamin is trusting that what I say can, can, can be true. He's trusting that 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 is, is, is trustworthy like the seatbelt. And then the other definition that we have for us is, and I got, I got these out of, out of, out of uh, Webster's here, the acceptance of the truth of a statement without evidence or investigation. So someone tells you something, and because of maybe their character or who they are or their reputation, you don't necessarily need evidence. You don't necessarily need to investigate you just trust and you accept the truth of that. So if someone walks up to you and says, this malva pudding is really, really, really good, and they're super, super skinny, they're probably not trustworthy. But if someone that's you know, got a little bit of heft to them, you know, they walk in the room and they, you know they're an expert on malva pudding, and they tell you, hey, that's really good, you don't need evidence or an investigation to believe in them. You can simply just trust in them. And so when we look at this idea of trust now, we're going to pivot. We're going to pivot now, taking it away from from our our lives and kind of the everyday areas where we trust God in these different ways or where we trust kind of the world in these different ways and bring God into it. And so the question today that we're going to ask is, why should I trust God? Why should I trust God? Or even better yet, is God trustworthy? Is He worthy of my trust? And see, this is the question that we ask ourselves when things don't go our way. It's the question that we ask when we're at the end of faith. It's the question that we ask ourselves when we don't understand why something is happening the way it's happening. So let's all be transparent enough to admit that we've come to a place in our lives many times where we've said, why should I trust in God? Maybe you don't know God, you don't believe in God. Maybe you've seen God... Uh, you know, kind of like what, what you would interpret as God letting people down. Maybe you just have had a bad encounter with a church, a previous church, and you think, why on earth should I trust 
this God? Or better yet, is God worthy of my trust? What has God done for me, for me to be able to believe that I can actually trust him? Is he, is he worthy of that? Because in my life, I've seen nothing but heartache and hardships and hard times. We're barely getting by. Is God worthy of my trust? See, th see th these are questions that we're asking. And so let's ask them out loud. And then let's answer them together. But I don't know about you, but when I think about these questions here, and when I think about my life, I, I come up against, especially if you're a Christian. So, so now I'm talking to the people that are Christ followers in the room. You're, you're a Christian. You're a Christ follower. And it's been indoctrinated in you that you should just have faith in God. You should just trust God because that's what you've been taught. And you've been taught not to not have faith and not to not trust God. And so in you... As life happens, and as you struggle with this question, there's probably this thing that builds in you that is just this, this uncomfortable tension. And see, this uncomfortable tension here is something that, that I'll be honest with you and transparent. I, I feel this. As your pastor here, there's many times where I'm driving out of Pinelands after a Sunday morning, I'm praying like, God, man, I need you to move. I need you to move in this church, or I'm praying for a certain person or a family, and it's like, God, please, please move. And sometimes... Those prayers don't get answered. And I have to remind myself, Chris, you are to have faith in God and you are to trust in God. But in me, there's a, there's, there's a tension of, should I even be asking that question? Is it okay to ask God about, uh, about whether or not I can trust Him? Can I say that out loud? And, and we're going to get into that later in this message. It is okay to trust God. Even if you feel an uncomfortable tension, it's okay to trust God. So I want to give you an example from the Bible of a guy named David. And David is, is writing here in Psalms, and we're going to look at uh, kind of a transformation that David makes in his life. So if you don't know David, if you're new to, to church or you're new to the Bible or to South Point, David was the, this famous Old Testament character. He was a real person. And David was, was a shepherd boy, and he was found uh, by a prophet, and he was kind of prophesied that he would become king of Israel, and he became king and then through David's bloodline is where you have Jesus. Jesus comes through through David's bloodline in in history. So David's like his his great 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 you know whatever times a million uh, grandfather. And so that that's the David that we're talking about. This is also the David that was chased by the king uh, King Saul. So Saul was a king, David was this young buck, you know, kind of coming up in the ranks and Saul got jealous and chased him out of the kingdom and was throwing spears at him and tried to kill him. And so David is a guy who has had this thing. He's literally been told by God, you're going to be king of the nation. And yet what's happening to him is the current king is trying to murder him and kill him. And so in that moment, David writes this, this psalm in Psalm 13 here, and we'll, we'll read it for you. How long, O Lord, so this is David, how long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? It's like, forget me forever. David's like, are you going to always forget that I exist and that I struggle? How long will you hide your face from me? God, I'm calling to you, but you're hiding from me. How long must I take counsel in my soul, having sorrow in my heart day after day? You know what it's like to take counsel in your soul? It's that dark moment in the middle of the night where you're just alone and you're like, I've got nothing that's helping me. I don't have a God that's listening to me. I don't have a friend to reach out to. I don't see a way to get out of my situation. There's no light at the end of the tunnel. I'm taking counsel in my own soul and the heartache and the pain of it and David he's having sorrow in his heart day after day and so this same David that writes this psalm this this gut-wrenching kind of heartbreaking psalm of saying God are you trustworthy God are you there can I trust you later, later on in psalms he comes back to God and he writes this some trust in chariots and some trust in horses. But we will remember and trust in the name of the Lord our God. And see, what's amazing here is there's a trans transformation that's happened in David's life. He went from saying, God, are you going to forsake me forever? To saying, hey, I trust you, Lord, that you are the Lord our God. And, and we will remember and trust in your name forever. 
And then if you keep reading Psalms, probably the next page, if you turn the page after chapter 20, the next page, you're going to see David again going, Oh Lord, have you forsaken me? Where are you? I don't understand why bad things are happening in my life. And if you turn the page again, you'll see again where, where David is saying, God, I trust you. And what, what we can see through David, who, who is known as one of the greatest kings and, and one of God's just beloved chosen people, it's okay to, to worry about, can I trust in God? And to kind of flip-flop back and forth here. Because we watch, we watch David do it. I mean, we just read about it here in the Scripture. And see, what, what's amazing about this verse here, and I think David is pinpointing maybe one of his own weaknesses. And this is a weakness of ours. Because he says, some people trust in chariots and some in horses. Those are things that you can see. And he says, but we will remember and trust in the name of the Lord our God, which is something that can't be seen. And so I want you to look at this statement here. It says that we often trust. We just going to put it on screen for you guys. We often trust more in what we can see than we might trust in the one that we can never see. And see, that's where our trust kind of wavers back and forth. That's where our trust kind of fades in and fades out. Because it's really easy to trust in the horses and the chariots in your life. Because a horse and a chariot represents a, a something that you know is going to take you into battle. So if you're, if you're in David's time and you have horses and you have chariots, you feel pretty confident that you can march into battle and you can take over, you can conquer, you can win this battle. It's something that you can see. It's something that's tangible. When your bank account is full, it's easy to trust God with your finances. When your vehicle's working, it's easy to trust God with your transport. When your wife or your husband's being faithful and there's nothing funny going on, it's easy to trust God in your marriage. It's easy to trust in the things that are tangible. But when we're only looking for something tangible to put our trust in, then we waver, we fall in and out, in and out of trust. You see, David is identifying in his life that it's trusting in God, the one that we can't see. That, that's the rock. That's the thing that solidifies us. Because chariots and horses, money, cars, material things, all the stuff in your life that makes you feel comfortable because you have it, those things one day will fade away. But the thing that never fades away is the unseen God who has real and tangible love for you. And so what I want to answer for you today in answering the question of, is God trustworthy? Is I want to show you how you grow to trust in a God that you cannot see. Because the issue is, is that we have a hard time trusting in something that we can't see. That, that's, that, that, that's what makes it hard. It's really difficult to say, I trust this, even though I can't see it. But there is a way for us to learn to do that. And that's exactly what we're going to do. So how do you grow to trust in a God that you cannot see? So if you're taking notes or if you're taking a nap, this is a great time to wake up here. Because I've got three points for you. And these, these are your takeaway points. Okay, These are the things that you can take away that can, that can really help you. And to do that, we're going to look at a story that we talked about a, a little bit last week. And it's a story in Mark. And in this story, there's a tragic situation that's happening. And to give you a little context, Jesus has been with his disciples. And Jesus takes three of his disciples with him. And they go up on a mountain. And they have this incredible experience with Jesus. It's called the transfiguration. You you can research it. You can look at it in your Bible. But they go up there. There's an amazing experience. And meanwhile, the other disciples are down in town... And while they're down there, they're doing miracles. They're they're casting out demons. They're claiming authority over things. They're healing people. They're praying for people. There's this movement of God that's happening down in town. And so Jesus and the three disciples, they come down off the mountain. And when they come back, this is when we jump into our story here. So we jump in in verse 14. So when they came back to, to the other nine, so the three come back, the disciples, they saw a large crowd that were around the the nine there. So they come back into town, back into the temple, and there's this huge crowd. And Jesus is looking in the middle of the crowd, maybe he sees his nine disciples. And and, and as a mentor, as a teacher, he's probably thinking one of two things. He's thinking, what have they done to get into trouble, is one. And then the other thing he's thinking is, is, I wonder what they're about to do to get into trouble. No, he's not thinking that. But, But he sees the nine of them and this crowd that's around them. 
And, and in the middle of that crowd are these people called scribes. And th these were like the, the people that memorized the Old Testament. These were the super religious people. These were the people that knew the law. They knew everything God told Moses. They knew everything that the Israelites had put in place to preserve and protect their relationship with God because Jesus has not died on the cross yet. And so they don't know that love. They don't know that redemptive power. And so you have the disciples that are there, the nine, and around them there are these scribes, these people that they know the Bible and they know everything that the Bible says and all the rules and all the laws. And the scribes are questioning and they're arguing with them. They're basically saying, what do you think you're doing? And what authority do you think you're doing it? And, and there's a bit of a scuffle that's going on. And so then in verse 15, we pick up and it says, immediately when the entire crowd saw Jesus. So there's like awkward pause, a pivot. Everyone turns and looks and sees Jesus standing there. They were startled and they began running up to greet him because Jesus did have a reputation for healing. He did have a reputation for casting out demons. He did have a reputation that preceded his presence. So they see him and they all run to him. And so when they run to him, Jesus asked, he asked them, what are you discussing with my disciples? What are you talking about with them? And then in verse 17 here, one of the crowd replies to Jesus. So God throws his hand up and says, Teacher, I brought you my son who is possessed with a spirit which makes him unable to speak. And so th this father has brought his son to Jesus because Jesus has his reputation of being a healing God. He has a reputation that miracles happen that are around him. And this father has a son who's unable to speak. He's got this son that, that's possessed by, by a demon. And see, what you have to realize is when we talk about things like being possessed by demons, you know, we think, oh, that sounds so weird. Why are they talking about demons? Demons are weird. They're going to do weird stuff here at this church. I'm ready to get out of here. Now, what you've got to realize is, hey, we, we all get kind of, we all have our own demon possession moments here, okay? We, we've all got it, you know? When you're stuck watching something on TikTok or on YouTube or on the Internet that you know you shouldn't be watching, guess what? The, the, there, there's a little bit of Satan there on your shoulder saying, I just keep watching, man. This feels good. This is where you need to be, right here in front of this computer. See, back in Jesus' time, they didn't have social media. They didn't have computers. They didn't have the Internet. They didn't have cars where they could drive and they could go to a bar and drink them, their sorrows away. They couldn't buy drugs, and they didn't have the access that we have now. But what they did have is they still had a very clever Satan who would do anything that he could do to disrupt people's lives and to hold people down and attack people. And so what would happen is that people would, would, would be possessed by a demon, meaning that, that they would just be overcome by Satan who came, as the Bible says, to kill, steal, and destroy. Satan will kill, steal, and destroy your marriage through the pornography that you watch on your computer. Satan will kill, steal, and destroy this son and this father and this family through possessing this boy. So I want to demystify the weirdness of it. It's not weird. What this is, is this is a spiritual battle where Satan's trying to get you and get everybody else, and Jesus wants to save you. And that's what's happening in this situation. So this father comes, and he says, he's unable to speak. I have my son and then he says in the next verse, in verse 18, he says, And whenever it seizes him, intending to do harm, it throws him down, and he foams at the mouth, and he grinds his teeth, and it becomes stiff. So think about kind of like having a, a seizure, like an epileptic seizure. And he says, I told your disciples to drive it out, and they could not do it. So he says, I, I brought my son to, to your disciples. These are your people who you trained. And I believed that they could heal, they could help my son, and I brought him, and guess what? Nothing happened. Not a thing. They couldn't do anything to help. And so then in verse 19, he replies. This is Jesus now talking. He's probably a little bit aggravated. He says, Oh, unbelieving, faithless generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring him to me. See, Jesus understands something about trust 
and about faith and about authority that his, di his disciples did not fully grasp. And so he calls them out on it. And he says, how long am I going to put up with you guys not learning, not picking this thing up? And Jesus is, a, is kind of a hard teacher here. He's really, you know, wrapping his 12 disciples over the knuckles with this. But he says with an exclamation point. I didn't put that exclamation point in there. That's in the Bible. It was translated that way. I can imagine Jesus saying, bring him to me now. I'm going to show you what I can do. And so the father brings him. And then in verse, in verse 20, the story goes on. And they brought the boy to him. And the second that the demonic spirit saw Jesus, immediately it threw the boy into a convulsion and, the, and, and, and failing to the, falling to the ground, he began rolling around and foaming at the mouth. You know, you know, just to put this into context for you, since we've been talking about porn, I guess somebody in here is struggling with porn because that's something that's on my, my heart this morning. That's something that, that, that God has placed on my heart to speak into. You know, if you're struggling with porn... Guess what? If you want to try something tricky, you want to try something, you want to go do like an experiment, when you're walking by that computer and there's a struggle there, why don't you just put your Bible in front of the screen and see what happens there? Why don't you just place it there? And, I, and I'm not talking about being weird. I'm just saying just put, just put your Bible there on the keyboard. So before you have to type in your website, you've got to move your, move your Bible out of the way. And see, what happened here is the second that this thing that was not of God, that was not of Jesus, sees Jesus, it, it freaks out. Because it, it, guess what? Jesus has authority over it. So it freaks out and has one last ditch, throws the guy on the ground, throws the kid on the ground, he's foaming at the mouth, all this crazy stuff is happening. And then Jesus replies to the Father. And he says in, in, the, in the next verse, he says in verse 21, Jesus asked the father, how long has this been happening to him? And the father answers, since childhood, the demon has often thrown him both into fire and into water, intending to kill him. And this is where we come to the first thing that you need to know about learning how to trust in God. And that's questioning. You can question God. It's okay to question God. And watch how the Father does that. See, Jesus has just asked him what happens with his boy. And the Father's told him. And then the Father questions God. And this is what he says. He says, Jesus, but if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. This is not a, a, a request. This is not a prayer. This is a question of Jesus' authority, a question of Jesus' ability. Jesus, if you're capable of doing anything, then take pity on us and help us. See, it's okay to question God. And in fact, we're closer to God when we're asking questions than when we think that we hold all the answers. See, it's okay to ask God questions. Because when we ask God questions, it draws us near to Him. It causes us to understand His heart or seek to understand His heart. The greatest place that Satan would love for you to be and the most dangerous place that you could be is you could be in a place where you think that you hold all the answers and you never question anything. You never ask God anything. You never try and figure anything out about why things are happening in your life. And, and you may think like that uncomfortable tension of, is it okay to question God? Yes, we are closer to God when we're asking questions than when we think that we hold all the answers. When we think we hold the answers, we're prideful. When we're asking God questions, we're humble. It's okay to do that. See, God would rather you run to Him with your questions than run away from Him with your doubts. Am I speaking to anybody in the room with that? Am I speaking to anybody that, that's online or any, the guys at the men's retreat? You know, we have doubts, and because we have doubts, we just run away from Jesus. I don't understand why God can be a loving God. I'm going to run away. I don't understand why those people at that church, why they say they're, they're nice and they're friendly, but yet they didn't greet me when I was there. I'm going to run away from church and run away from that. I don't understand why these things are happening in my life. So you know what? I'm going to run away from Jesus, run away from church. You know, how's that life working for you? It's lonely. It's hard. You don't have a God you can put faith in. See, Jesus doesn't want you to run away full of doubt. Instead, he's saying, you can come to me with anything and everything. God would rather you run to him with your questions. Run to God with your questions. And that's what this father does in the story. 
And so then Jesus answers him. And in verse 22 here, Jesus says to the guy, But if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. So Jesus repeats his question. But if. And Jesus said to him, You say to me, if you can. See, I've got if highlighted to you in, in both those instances because Jesus is making a connection there that it's about having trust in him. It, it's, it's, Jesus is not speaking to the, the, the demon or the boy. He's not speaking to the healing of the boy. What he's speaking to is the heart of the questioner, speaking to the heart of the father who's asking the question. He says, oh, but if, if I can help you, well, I tell you what, it, it really, it's, it's if you say that I can. Jesus is saying, are you going to trust me? I can do it. But how about you? What role are you going to play in this? And so Jesus then says, all things are possible for the one who believes and, say this word, trust in me. All things are possible for the one who believes and trusts in me. And then in verse 24, this beautiful thing happens. Man, I love this verse. It's one of my favorite verses. It's a prayer that I pray more than any other prayer. The father, immediately the father of the boy cried out with a desperate and piercing cry saying, I do believe, but help me overcome my belief. Help me overcome my belief. That's, that's prayer. And that's, or help me overcome my unbelief. Thanks, Alan. See, I believe in God so much, I don't even know the word unbelief. <laughs> I've got that prayer, you know. Yeah. As Casey would say, lightning may hit somewhere up here. Now, the, the, this, is, this is the most beautiful prayer that we can pray. And this is the second step in learning how to trust God. First you question, then you pray. First you question God. Then the next thing you do is you pray. And this is the prayer. I, I do believe. So God, help my unbelief. Th this is such a safe prayer that, that you can pray. This is such a safe thing for you. It's, it's so comforting to me that I know that, you know what, even when I don't believe or I don't have confidence or I don't have faith, I can say, God, will, will you help me believe Will, will, will you help me with my unbelief? See, this is an honest prayer. This is a truly, truly honest prayer. And this is why this is one of my favorite prayers ever. Because there's a lot of days where I know that I should have faith in something. I know that I should trust something. I know that, that, that I should trust in God and be faithful. I know I should do all that stuff. And I run to God with my questions. And I run to God with my doubts. And then, then I read something in the Bible and it tells me, oh, you should have faith and you should believe. And somebody speaks into my life and they say, oh, but Chris, let me tell you my testimony about how God helped me and what God did to restore me. And it's like, oh, that's amazing. That's really, that's really amazing. But I, I can't believe that for myself. And so, God, I come to you with my unbelief. Help me overcome my unbelief. I want you to pray this prayer this week. I want you to pray this prayer every single day with the stuff that you're struggling to trust God with, with help me to overcome my belief. And see, that, that's the second part of this. The, the third part of this equation of learning how to, how to trust in God, and Lethal will put it up here on the screen for you, is, is surrender. Jump, jump forward. I'll take a minute to pause right now and say my, my, my son... Uh, is upstairs running the, the computer, and it's such a, um, like a, a sweet, special moment for me as a dad, yeah, and he's doing a great, he's doing a great job, I believe in him so much, he's fantastic, um, so learning to trust in God, the third thing that we do is, is we surrender, see, we question God, we pray, but then there's, there's an element of surrender that comes with it. And see, surrender requires that you trust God even when you don't understand. So oof, that's the hard part. Because it's easy to trust God when we understand. But see, when you get to that point in your life where there's no way for you to make it work, there's no way for you to understand it, there's no way for you to see a solution, 
There's no way for you to, to even wrap your head around it's how it's going to happen. You don't know how the money's going to show up. You don't know how the marriage is going to repair. You don't know how you're going to kick that habit of alcohol or abuse or porn or whatever it is. You don't know how it's going to happen. You have no idea. So why would I trust God? No, no, it's the opposite of that. See, surrender requires that you choose to trust God. And guess what you get to do when you surrender? You get to pray that wonderful prayer. God, I surrender to you, but help my unbelief. Help me to believe. So I, I, I'll give you a verse that, that illustrates this here in, in Proverbs 3, 5. It says, Trust in and rely confidently on the Lord with all your heart, and do not rely on your own insight or your own understanding. See, the, the point here to this is that our own insights and our own understandings are completely flawed. They, they are unbelievably flawed. In everything, not just spiritually, but, but we can't put together a bookcase without directions. Because our insights, our understanding on even how to do simple tasks, oftentimes don't lead us in the right direction. And so if we can't figure out how to put furniture together, or we can't figure out how to take care of you know, uh, changing fixtures around our house, then how are we going to be able to understand all this deep spiritual stuff that's happening in our life? See, our, our, our own insights and understandings don't rely on that. Rely on God instead. Trust in and rely confidently in the Lord with all your heart. And do not rely on your own insight or your own understanding. You know who wrote this in Proverbs? It's David's son, which, which I think is pretty cool. Because David passed down some wisdom to him. In fact, in, in the next verse, Proverbs 3, 6, it goes on to say, In all your ways, know and acknowledge and recognize Him. So that's God. And He will make your path straight and smooth removing any obstacles that block your way. See, we're not to lean on our own understanding, but to trust in the limitless one, even though we don't understand it. See, we, we, we don't have to lean on our own understanding. It's not up to us to clear our path and to clear the things that block the way. God does that. God does that for us. It's not up to us to try and wrap our head around how something's going to happen or how something's not going to happen. God does that. God does that for us. So, so let me say that for you one more time. Lifa, put that up here on the screen for everybody. It's, it's, we, we are not to lean on our own understanding. So I'm going to stop leaning on my own understanding. And instead, I'm going to trust in the limitless one, in the limitless God, in the limitless love of Jesus, in the limitless abounding faithfulness that comes from my heavenly Father, even though I don't understand it. You know what? Let me tell you something. I don't ever want to understand God's love. Because the second that I understand God's love, it means it's smaller than it actually is. Because God's love is so big and unfathomable that, that if I could understand it, that means that, that it would take it out of this realm of huge and unfathomable and wonderful and amazing. And it would put it in a box that makes sense to me. Which means that it would shrink down from this, this God that created the universe and sent His Son to die for me. And, and if I could understand it, it would be in my, my own human understanding. You know, I don't want to understand human love. I want to lean on godly love. I want to I believe in something that is bigger than what I can understand. Because then when I don't understand why things are happening in my life, I've got a love that I don't understand because it's so big and it's so good and it's so huge and it's so for me and it's so limitless. So stop trying to get to a place where you can understand God's love for you. See, one hard truth here that we have to look at is when it comes to trusting God, trusting God does not mean that you always get what you want. <clears throat> and this is what's hard for, for us. Because at, at the end of the day, when you've done everything we've talked about in this sermon, you're still just, you still just hope God does what you ask Him to do. I'll, I'll share a moment with you just being transparent about me and, and my life. Um, when our son Benjamin was born about three years ago, I went through one of my biggest major depressive breakdowns. And Casey and I, we were on a walk and we were walking around Rondebosch Common. And it was a, a, a point in time where 
I had come to a place in my life where I said it's easier to not pray than it is to pray and be disappointed. So I'd rather just not believe in God. It's easier to not believe in God than it is to believe in a God that I don't understand. It's easier to not believe in God than it is to believe in a God that's not answering my prayers. Because God, I'm trusting in you. I'm praying that, that, that you believe. I'm praying that, that, I'm praying that you help my unbelief. I'm quoting scripture. I'm doing all these things. But I still had this thing in me. But okay, God, I'm doing all of that. But still, I expect you to take away from me the hurt and the pain that I feel and the disappointment that I'm carrying and the anxiety and the depression. God, I'm, I'm believing in you. I'm trusting in you. And come on, come on, take it. Take it away. Take it away. And he didn't give me that. I went through it every day. And I still go through it every single day. And that's why I don't ever want to understand God's love. Because if I understand it, it's too small. I want God's big, ununderstandable love. And I can tell you, my testimony here is I'm so glad that God did not give me what I wanted. Because He had so much more for me. He had so much better for me. And He believed in me in ways that I didn't believe in myself. And when I was sitting there, walking with my wife, saying, I'd rather not believe in this God than believe in Him and be disappointed. Guess what was happening? Is my loving Heavenly Father was actually hugging me tighter. Was actually loving me more. He never left me. I just pretended that I walked away from Him. But He actually never left me. And so when it comes to trust, something that I want you to take away and think about is this. Is, is what you fear the most is what you trust God with the least. So what you fear the most is what you trust God with the least. The thing that you're the most afraid of losing, the thing that you're most afraid of happening, that thing is the thing that you're struggling to trust God with the absolute least. Well, I, I want to leave you with some encouragement in that. And so I'm going to read a verse for you here. I'm going to give you guys a, a, a scripture bomb. And it says in Romans 8, 28, For we know with great confidence, great confidence, I have great confidence in a God because He didn't give up on me and He let me walk through hard times and He has ununderstandable, unlimiting love for me and it abounds gracefully and fully for me and He never walked away from me. And because of that, I know with great confidence that God who is deeply concerned about me. Guys, God is concerned about you. He's deeply concerned about you. He causes all things to work together as a plan for good, for those who love God, to those who are called according to His plan and to His purpose. Guys, God is concerned about you. He cares about you. He deeply loves you. And when you have a hard time trusting God and finding your way in God, God gives us this thing. Psalms 119, 105 says this, The Word is a lamp that guides my feet. So let's take, let's take this Word that guides our feet. All right? Let's, let, let's go on a, on a quick journey before the band comes out and, and leads us in another song. The Word is a lamp that guides my feet. The Word is a lamp that builds your trust. The Word is the thing that you can dig into to help build your trust in God. The Word is the reason why God is trustworthy in our lives. So let me ask you this. Do you ever feel afraid and overwhelmed? Well, guess what? If you feel afraid and overwhelmed, I, I've got a verse for you here. Lifa, put that verse up. For the Spirit of God has made me, and the breath of the Almighty gives me life. I don't have to be afraid and overwhelmed because the Spirit of God has made me. Do you feel overcome with depression or anxiety in your life? Well, I've got a verse for you on that there. Lifa, throw that verse up. Let's go. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you and through the rivers. They will not overwhelm you. When you walk through fire, you will not be scorched, nor will the flame burn you. Come on. This is truth for you. You feel overwhelmed with depression. You know what? A flame won't even burn me. When you feel weak in your life, then we can turn to Isaiah and we can read this for ourselves. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. I feel weak. God, I don't know if I can trust you. But I'm going to wait on you. And as I wait on you, I realize that you're renewing my strength in me. And so they shall mount up with wings as eagles. And they shall run and not be weary. And they shall walk and not be faint. Guys, I've lived this out in my life day in and day out. And it is the absolute truth. But what about when the future is bleak for you? When the future 
is hopeless for you. Well, you can turn to Jeremiah 29 and 11. It says, For I know the thoughts that I think towards you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace, not of evil, to give you an expected end. See, Jesus is so for you. But what about when sadness and sorrow seems to never end in your life? Well, then we can turn to Psalms 30. For his anger is but a moment. His favor is for a lifetime. Weeping may endure for a night. Guys, get through your dark night. That's when it's the hardest. In the middle of the night, when you're crying, when the heart hurts, when the sun's not up, when everyone else is asleep, when you've convinced yourself that everyone else has got peace in their life, and you're going through your dark night of the soul, remember this verse. Weeping may not endure for the night. It won't. But a shout of joy comes in the morning. Get through your night. Just get through your night. See, I may not know what the future holds for me or for you, but I know who holds it. And he's trustworthy. He's not understandable. He's not something you can put in a box, but he's trustworthy. And so I want to give you guys an opportunity to respond to this. And, and, and in this moment, the reason that we do this moment, if you're new here in church, is when you walk out of those doors, life happens. And when you walk out of there, the kids are there and life is going on and, and, and everything that, that's happening in here kind of quietens down and gets, gets pushed down a little bit. I just want to give you a time to respond. And, and I just want to ask you to, to, to lean into it. This is your moment where nothing else can get you and get your attention and just give God a, a chance to speak to you. So it's a time to respond. And the way that, that we do that is the band is going to come out and they're going to lead us in a worship song. It's, it's one of my favorite songs and it's wonderful. And you can stand, you can sing to that. And then we're going to have in the corners, we're going to have some prayer partners and I'll, I'll call them down here in just a second. And these people are there just simply to pray for you. And so guys, if, you're tr if you have a, a trust issue with God, Come and, and get some prayer. But if you need prayer for anything in your life, anything, then you can come forward and someone will pray for you. We're not going to solve your problems. We're not going to be your solution. We're going to stand with you and pray with you and trust in God. And so let, let, let me pray for us. Lord, Heavenly Father, thank you.